switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But there are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now, presenting a man whose name since the beginning of broadcasting has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, at home and in our studio audience, so welcome to CBS's Cavalcade of America. My name is Graham McNamee, I'm the most famous announcer in America. <laughs> uh, tonight's program is Nazi Saboteurs Land at Amagansett, Long Island, June 13, 1942. Okay, now, before we begin, I want to uh, welcome Matt Hendra and the USA Warrior Stories. Matt is going to be filming this tonight, and they bring to light and screen our American War Hero Stories. And believe it or not, tonight, we have one of those heroes <laughs> sitting right down front, Martin Sylvester. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> now, Martin was one of the first veterans that Nick Krause and Matt Hendra did, recording these USA War Stories. And when they finished the interview, they asked him if there was anything else he wanted to add. And he said, did I tell you about the time I was put in front of a firing squad? <laughs> well, we learned a valuable lesson that day. Never stop recording. <laughs> Martin grew up in Brooklyn on April 4th, 1943. He turned 18 and registered for the draft. Martin, a Jewish American, landed on Utah Beach on June 7th, 1944. Fought in the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest and the Battle of the Bulge served with the U.S. Army G, 12th Regiment, 4th Infantry Division. Martin didn't know it until he returned home from the war, but his brother Ernie was killed while in combat in the Hugon Forest. During the Battle of the Bulge, Martin was wounded and taken prisoner. Now, wait till you hear this. <coughs> Martin would eventually escape, only to be captured again, and escape again, <laughs> be captured again, and escape again <laughs> before being taken in by a German family and finally liberated by a U.S. Army Advanced Armored Unit and flown to a hospital in Paris. At the hospital, he weighed 80 pounds. He had ice and lice and fleas. He was told that his leg would have, be, would have become uh, infected without treatment and he probably would have lost it. And this is from Martin's memoir. Martin Sylvester, everyone. Yeah. Martin said most of that is true. <laughs> okay. Now we want to thank Jeannie Henderson for all her guidance pictures and newsreels tonight. Matt, of course, is filming this. And then Stacy Myers, who's been running around turning on the microphones and turning them off and doing everything else. So thank you very much. Okay, now, the next thing we got to do is after this is over, there'll be questions for the audience. Now if you get them right, there's no fee for parking. <laughs> And then finally, uh, we want to introduce the cast, okay? Here we go. Elena Prohaska Glynn, a graduate of Amagansett Grade School, is making her radio debut in tonight's <laughs> performance. She made her acting debut in the Guildhall Players production of Rumpelstiltskin, <laughs> starring the late, great Carl Kelsey, Susan Relstad, and Connie Bossel. The play got terrible reviews. <laughs> Ted Hulse is a graduate of Spring School and made his acting debut at the Royal Fishes Theater in the Round, playing a part that required him to wear goggles and flippers and bark like a dog. <laughs> he has played Peter Berger on all our other reenactments. Sonny Cerisi is also a graduate of Spring School and made his acting debut in the third grade production of Rumpelstiltskin, <laughs> playing the lead part of Rumpelstiltskin. He has played Seaman John Cullen in all the previous reenactments. He's also the CEO of Sonny's Painting, 631-324. If you have the money, you can call Sonny. David 
Aletta was making his radio de debut in tonight's production. He's a graduate of the East Ham School System as currently a teacher in the system. He's also an East Ham Town Trustee if, if, because if you don't like your clam license, you know who to blame. And believe it or not, he also met his future wife while walking his dog in the woods. Okay, Isabel Carmichael, playing Mrs. Jeanette Edwards Rattray, longtime owner of the East Stanton Star, actually works at the paper as a, proof, a proofreader. Now you get ready to applaud. You ready? She actually lived in this building. And that's why it took us so long to restore it. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce uh, someone whose column, one of ours, is the mainstay of our local newspaper, the East Stanton Star, Mrs. Jeanette Edwards Rattray, who will tell you what was happening in East Hampton in June of 1942. Mrs. Rattray, applause. Benefit Stanton arranged to aid USO to meet $6,000 quota. Kenneth E. Davis, chairman of the United Service Organizations Campaign Fund, reports that the fund has already reached $300, although the house-to-house -house canvas has just started. East Hampton's town quota is $6,000. This will not be easy to attain unless every individual cooperates. The USO picture shown at Edwards Theatre over the weekend brought a generous response from patrons. Due to the work and appeals of high school girl volunteers with collection boxes, over $10 was added to the fund. <laughs> Mrs. Leonard Edwards and Mrs. Maud Taylor have joined the list of captains and will canvas stores on Main Street and Newtown Lane for contributions to the USO fund. This is a letter from the Air Corps Technical School, Flight A, 393rd Squadron, Keesler Field, Mississippi, June 1, 1942. Editor at the Star. Dear Sir, I wish to thank you for sending me the Star. I enjoy reading about the hometown news, when so far from home. From what I have read, the weather back home must be nice. This is the time of year a person should enjoy East Hampton. It will probably be a long time before most of us get home, so I wish when we do get back, we will find East Hampton as peaceful as it was when we left. Sincerely yours, Private Norton W. Daniels. Now, here's a little advice from the phone company. Listen up. Your use of the telephone in wartime. You can help us serve both you and the war effort if you will keep in mind these simple suggestions. Number one, answer your telephone promptly. Even seconds are important these days. However, when you make a call, give the other fellow enough time to reach his telephone before you hang up. Number two, look up numbers you're not sure of. Refer to your personal number list or, your, or the directory and call information only when you can't find the number there. Number three, hang up the receiver carefully. <laughs> a book or other object under the receiver may put your telephone out of service. Replacing the receiver carefully will ensure you're getting all incoming calls. Number four, keep pad and pencil handy. Having to look for them during a telephone conversation wastes time. <laughs> Keeping notes avoids mistakes and confusion. So have pad and pencil by your telephone. From the New York Telephone Company. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now let's go to that fateful night of June 13, 1942 as a German U-boat has landed in Amagansett, and Coast Guardsman John Cullen encounters George Das and Peter Berger, two of the saboteurs. We made it, boys. Do you have your money? Do you have your money belt and pocket money? Yes. 
and I have the briefcase with the money. I have a feeling that is, this expedition is going to go wrong. Shut up! <laughs> Did we all remember to go through our belongings to remove anything incriminating us to be German? What about our cigarettes? Shut up! I'm the leader, not you. <laughs> but I can't stop thinking about my wife back in Germany. Oh, shut up. We're in America now. We have a job to do. What did Captain Linder say to do if we encounter any patrols on the beach? We are to overpower them and send them back to the submarine for interrogation. <coughs> hey, there's a beacon of light down the beach. We must have landed near a Coast Guard station. Hurry up and bury the explosives, quickly. We'll, we'll bury them in the dunes in case the Coast Guard comes. Hurry up and quickly change into your civilian clothes. Tangerine, yay, my little tangerine. Stop. Stop. Someone's coming. Quiet. Quiet. Who, who, who are you? Uh, Coast Guard? Yes. Who are you? Um, fishermen from East Hampton. Uh, we're trying to get back to Montauk, but our boat ran aground. Uh, we're waiting for the sunrise. What do you mean, East Hampton? In Montauk? That doesn't make sense. Do you know where you are? I don't believe I know where we landed, but you should know. You're in Amagansett. That's my station over there. Uh, why don't you come to the station and stay overnight? All right. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I'm not going with you. What? Why not? Uh, because I have no identification card, and I have no permit to fish. Uh, that's all right. We'll, we'll help you out. You'd better come along now. No! I won't go. You... you have to come. Listen, how old are you? Uh, tw twenty-one. Have you a mother and a father? Y yes. Look, I wouldn't want to kill you. You don't know what this is about. Forget about this, and I'll give you some money, and you can have a good time. See? We've got clams. <laughs> clam shells, that's what they are. Um, we've been clamming. Get up. You won't stand a chance. Let's end it right here. It'll be easier. It'll be over quickly. Shut up and get back. Come over here. Here's $300. Uh, okay. Take a good look at my face. Look in my eyes. Would you recognize me if you saw me again? No, no, sir. No, I'll, I never saw you before. You might see me in East Hampton sometime. Would you know me? Uh, no, I, I never saw you in my life. You might hear from me again. My name is George John Davis. What's your name, boy? Uh, Frank Collins, sir. I'm leaving now. What do we do now? I was right. I knew this would end badly. Shut up. <laughs> Let's finish burying the explosives for when we come back later. Then let's get off the beach before the Coast Guard comes. <laughs> Uh, now, we're going to go to, go to the Anacanser Life Saving Station and hear a report from Boatswain's mate, second class Carl Jeanette, who was in charge of the station that night. How do you do? I'm Carl Jeanette. At approximately 12.20 a.m., John C. Cullen, who had departed previously on East Patrol, returned to the station. He rushed into the sleeping quarters, repeating, Let's go, Jeanette! as he entered. I saw that the man was quite excited and asked him what was the trouble. He stated that four men on the beach had a boat in the water that looked like a flat-bottomed skiff, and one man was dragging a heavy canvas bag on the beach. When he made his approach toward the men, he was stopped by them and told to keep his mouth shut about what he had seen, mm -hmm. and forced to take bribe money, which, which he showed to me. I then all ordered all members of the crew present called. After quickly questioning Cullen, 
I armed the crew and told them to stand guard on the porch while I got in touch with Mr. Odin by telephone. Unable to do so, I notified Mr. Chillar, officer in charge of Nap Peak Station, of what was taking place and asked him to get in touch with Mr. Odin at once. Also informed him that I was leaving to make an investigation and see what was going on. Then we departed with Cullen and five other members of the crew. Cullen directed us to the location where he had met the four men on the beach. A thorough search was started, finding only unidentified marks and footprints in the sand. So I then ordered that a search be made back of the sand hills. Finding nothing unusual back of the hills, I then placed two men to guard the road leading from the beach to the main highway. I sent Billy B. Montgomery back to the station to call Warren Barnes. He was the officer in charge by telephone to report to the station at once. With three men left, I returned to the beach and sighted an unidentified boat. Unable to distinguish the type of boat due to the dense fog, after sighting the object, I gave orders to keep back behind the sand fence near the hills to keep from being seen. After watching the boat a few minutes longer, I left Cullen and crew and went to the road where the guard was posted, finding the officer in charge and Montgomery. Informing him of what occurred, we proceeded to the beach. Now, on our arrival at the beach, I pointed out to them the object offshore. Shortly after the motors of the boat were started, which were very loud and distinct. After running the motors for several minutes, the boat disappeared and the noise of engines ceased. When the engines were started, the officer in charge left the station to, mis to notify Mr. Odin and returned in about 15 minutes with a man from Nap Peak Station. About 30 minutes more, men began to arrive from Nap Peak Station who had come with the East Patrol unit. Now, Mr. Barnes then gave me orders to post the men in pairs along the beach hills. Soon after the orders were carried out, I heard those motors running for about 10 minutes and, and were believed to be the same motors we had heard previously. The approximate time was about 3.30 a.m. At daybreak, the fog began to leave and a Coast Guard patrol boat was coming from U-boat, which was the only thing in sight of land. I returned to the lookout tower and met Mr. Glynn and another officer from the barge office in New York. They asked me to show them the place where the above described occurrences took place. So now, after inspecting the location, we returned to the station 15 minutes later, and the officer in charge arrived and told me to get in touch with Mr. Odin by telephone and tell him, come to the station at once. Well, Mr. Barnes called me in the boat room and showed me a canvas bag and boxes he had found buried in the sand and ordered me and Seaman Cur Curley to stand guard and to let no one enter without proper authority. After part of the contents was examined by the men, Glenn and fellow officer departed with their findings for a barge office in New York. I returned then to the beach with Seaman Branks and covered up the holes where the boxes and bag were found, repaired to the station with Branks. This is a statement of what I did on the morning of June 13, 1942. Signed, Carl Jeanette. Witnessed by Warren Barnes. Now we're going to hear from Seaman Second Class Charles DeGeorge and his recollections of that, of that night. All of these are actual uh, depositions taken from the men uh, that night or early the next day. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. DeGeorge. Charles V. DeGeorge, Seaman Second Class. Amagansett Lifeboat Station. My version of the incidents on the morning of June 13, 1942. On Friday night, June 12, 1942, Kay Dowling, H. O'Neill, and myself were allowed to go to a dance at the Servicemen's Club East Hampton. After which, Dowling and myself returned to the station at approximately 12.45 a.m. the morning of June 13, 1942. We were given a ride by a man working on the construction job at the rear of the station, and we too were dropped off in the rear yard of the station. As we left the car, we were immediately challenged by other members of my crew who were armed with rifles. I was recognized, and I immediately inquired as to what was wrong, 
being that the crew were all out and armed at that time of night, which had never happened before. I was told that there were Germans on the beach, and to get a rifle from the storeroom and join them on the beach, as they were going there immediately. Dowling and I took off our white uniforms in favor of our blue uniforms, so that we wouldn't be easily seen on the beach. We secured two rifles, and were loading them in the mess hall when our commanding officer, Chief Boson's mate, Warren Barnes, came in and asked us what was going on, as he had been called from home by another member of the crew on the telephone. We related to him as much as we knew about the incident. The three of us left immediately to join the rest of the crew on the beach. On the way, we met Montgomery at the foot of the lookout tower, who related the, de the details of the incident to the skipper. That is, as much as had happened at, to that point, which was about 1.15 a.m. The four of us went east on the beach and joined the rest of our crew at the rear of the third house, where they were searching for the four men who Cullen had met on the beach. Dowling and I were given, given orders to remain at that point and to keep watch for these men or anything which might be suspicious. The rest of the crew, crew left for other points as directed by Mr. Barnes. After about half an hour, I heard the roar of diesel engines coming from the direction of the beach. I immediately went to the top of the, dune, the sand dune adjacent to the beach where I had a full view of the beach and sea and saw nothing, the visibility being very poor. I remained there trying to determine the source of the noise and as I looked seaward I made out the shadow of a shape close to shore which I thought was a submarine. Dowling and I, believing ourselves to be alone at this point, remained at this point, believing that the sub was trying to land more men. The noise of the submarine stopped, and we later saw other members of our crew along the beach as they had also heard the submarine. Chief Barnes ordered us to take cover behind the sand fences and to be ready for anything, as perhaps the submarine would land more men. We then heard the submarine engine start again, and I was again able to make out the outline of the submarine through the fog. The sound of the engines gradually faded away as though the submarine was going away toward the east. And I didn't hear the engines again that night. Montgomery and I were then sent along the beach to the east to find Fullington, who had gone to the army tent, and, as we, and were to tell him to return. On the way east, we met Fullington, who was jo returning to join the crew. The three of us then returned together to join the rest of the crew near the tower. We were assigned a post, and W. Cropsey and I patrolled the road and vicinity east of Atlantic Avenue until about 7.30 a.m., until which time we had, nothing, had seen nothing out of the ordinary. Signed, Charles V. DeGeorge, Seaman, Second Class. I would like to reintroduce Mrs. Jeanette Edwards Rattray, who will tell us the ending of the story. What became of the saboteurs and of John Cullen? Once the saboteurs, led by George Dash, had encountered Seaman John Cullen and finished burying the explosives and other items, they started making their way to the train station, actually less than a mile away, although because of the thick fog, it took them about two hours to find it. For some reason that has never been explained in any of the accounts, the Coast Guard had not thought of looking for them at the train station, where, in fact, they had to wait almost two more hours to catch the 657 Express. <laughs> Once in Manhattan, Dash and Berger met privately and decided to expose the mission and everyone in it, including the four men in the Florida landing operation. And quickly, with the green light from President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, tried them by military tribunal. Six of the total of eight men were condemned to death by electric chair, which took place on August 8th. Dash and Berger were sentenced to a certain amount of time at hard labor and then sent back to Germany in 1948, never to be allowed in the US again, even though Dash had been promised a presidential pardon.
John Cullen was awarded the Legion of Merit for his actions, but not till the following year. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, question number one. What was the USO quota for East Hampton Town? How much money? $6,000. $6,000 is correct. Okay. Where was a dance to be held to benefit the USO? The Devon Yacht Club. Where was the picture show to be seen to raise money for the USO? Edwards Theater. The Edwards Theater. What serviceman wrote a letter to the East Hampton Star? Norton. Norton Bucket Daniels. Bucket Daniels. That's right. Uh, what were the saboteurs to do if encountering a patrol on the beach? Take them to the submarine. Take them to the submarine. Overpower them and take them to the submarine. How much money did Dash offer Cullen? Well, everybody got that one, didn't they? Why was Carl Jeanette in charge of the station that night? Warren Barnes was having dinner with Commander Odin at the end of Talmadge Lane in East Hampton. Yes, and the family still owned the house a while ago. That's where we got all those depositions from the Barnes family. Okay. What noise did De George hear in the water? Diesel, diesel, diesel engines. Where was De George before the incident? East of the library. He was at a dance yes. at the yes. servicemen's club. Oh. Some people are going to be paying for parking. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the saboteur? Executed. Yeah, six were executed, two went back. And what award was Cullen given? The Legion of Merit. Merit. All right, name the four sponsors of tonight's program. What? Sea Spray In. Sea Spray In. Maidstone Arms. Sunny's Painting. Sunny's Painting. That's a good one. What else? Thank you and the Maidstone Market. Okay. Latest film news of the global war. On May 26 and 28, 1942, two German submarines left the base at Lorient. One landing on Long Island, the second landed in Florida. Four saboteurs landed from each submarine. They were well equipped with high explosives. <laughs> Admiral Parker presents the Legion of Merit to Coast Guardsman John C. Cullen. I take pleasure in presenting to you this medal which has been awarded to you. At the trial which led to the execution of the saboteurs, it was told how they were trained by the Nazi Gestapo for espionage and destruction in the United States and were landed by German submarines. A party of saboteurs were found by Coast Guardsman Cullen, and they resorted to bribes and threats. It was his report that led to the detection of the gang and the breaking up of a dangerous conspiracy.